Earth, a unique planet, restless and dynamic. Continents shift and clash. Volcanoes erupt. Glaciers grow and recede. Titanic forces that are constantly at work, leaving a trail of geological mysteries behind. This episode explores Yosemite Valley, a magnificent 3,000-foot deep canyon. Traveling through time, scientists are unlocking deep secrets trapped inside these granite walls. These rocks have literally been to hell and back, frozen, drenched, and battered by earth-shattering forces. One more chapter in the incredible story of how the Earth was made. In the foothills of the mighty Sierra Nevada, California, lies a valley like no other on Earth, Yosemite a seven-mile-long, one-mile-wide granite canyon. Here lie some of the most awe-inspiring geological features on the planet. Half Dome, America's most iconic peak. Yosemite Falls, the highest unbroken waterfall on the continent. And El Capitan, one of the biggest sheer cliffs in the world. The Europeans discovered this astonishing valley only 150 years ago. These sheer walls and granite cliffs and high waterfalls was a marvel to them as it is to us. Ever since it shot to fame, Yosemite has been shrouded in mystery. It's almost as if there was a higher power at work that basically said, that looks really good right about there. And then just put a little bit of grass right there and put some oak, like an oak woodland right through there. And that, that, that's it, that's perfect. Because it doesn't seem like anything was haphazard. It seems like this was designed to overwhelm and to leave people awestruck. Yosemite's unique design has intrigued scientists for centuries. I think when you see something that is this dramatic, you just have questions. And the question is, how did this happen? How did it get monoliths, these huge stone structures that are just rising thousands of feet off the valley floor? How does that come to pass? And for over 100 years, people have been trying to answer that question. The story begins in 1870, when amateur geologist John Muir went hunting for the answer. Founder of the Sierra Club, he funded his obsession with the valley by herding sheep and writing articles about Yosemite. He wrote that no temple made with hands can compare with Yosemite. Muir scoured the landscape for clues as to how this unusual box-shaped canyon formed and came up with a radical, seemingly far-fetched theory. He believed that the world's climate was once extremely different and the lush canyon where the Merced River flows was filled by a gigantic glacier thousands of feet thick. Muir proposed that as this river of ice slowly flowed downhill over thousands of years, it gouged a deep canyon and sliced vertical cliffs into the granite walls. But that controversial idea brought him into conflict with a fearsome opponent, the admired California state geologist, Professor Josiah Whitney. Josiah Whitney did not have much respect for John Muir because Josiah Whitney was a state geologist. And at that time, John Muir was herding sheep. Certainly he's thinking, what does this man know about this range? How dare he? Whitney believed that this unusually square, steep-sided valley could only have been formed by a sudden cataclysmic event. He was adamant that giant cracks in the earth caused the valley to pull apart and dramatically sink, cleaving steep cliffs as it fell. This bitter Whitney-Muir conflict raged on for decades, but now scientists are hoping to figure out this complex puzzle once and for all. The first stage of the investigation is to understand how the rocks themselves were created. The canyon is made almost entirely of Yosemite granite, one of the hardest rocks in the world. To understand how this formed, scientists must travel back in time 
to the beginning. It's 250 million years ago, and the landscape is very different. Dinosaurs roam the land and dominate the skies. An incredibly rare remnant of that time has been discovered northwest of the valley at Mount Hoffman. This patch of softer reddish rock is the oldest in the park. It's sandstone, and it once covered the entire region. This rock is very different than most of the rock in Yosemite. It's much darker in color. It's got a different texture. This was originally a sedimentary rock that was deposited in layers. On an ancient shore, sand and sludge compacted together, and over millions of years formed this sandstone. This tranquil landscape was transformed by an earth-shattering event deep below the surface, and the evidence lies here in the rock. Here we have this older layered sedimentary rock. You can see that many layers and banding, which continues across over into here, but strangely, this section of granite has cut right through the sedimentary rock and split this section in two. How this unusual rock formation formed can be explained by a simple experiment using sand and wax. This red wax here represents granite. The sand represents sedimentary rock. And right now I'm heating it to see what's gonna happen when the wax melts. Actually, I start to hear some, oh, here it goes. We're actually getting a little bit of the wax pushing up through the sand, and the molten wax is lighter, and so it's pushing its way up through the sand, which represents the sedimentary rock. Yep, there's some more. It proves the only way granite could have cut through this sandstone is if it was originally molten and able to flow like a liquid. Molten rock forms deep within the earth, rises up through the crust, in this case, forced its way through a crack, expanding it open, and then cooling and solidifying to form this band of granite. This band of granite tells scientists that Yosemite's cliffs were once molten and heated to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. 95% of the rock in Yosemite is granite. And I can see with the naked eye all the crystals in here. They're fairly large, and that tells me that this rock cooled very slowly. Scientists were now on the hunt for what was generating all this molten rock. The investigation led them to Mount Gibbs, another unusually colored mountain in the northern reaches of the park. It lies above a layer of granite and is made from reddish gray rock. Strangely, these rocks were also once molten. Here I have a rock from Mount Gibbs. And I can see that most of the crystals are very, very small. Most of them I can't even see. These small crystals tell an incredible story. When molten rock cools quickly in the open air, crystals don't have time to grow. And what that tells me is that this is a volcanic rock that was spewed out at the surface. It is 200 million years ago. Volcanoes shatter the tranquil west coast. The earth explodes with molten rock. For the next hundred million years, lava pours thick and fast onto the land, covering the sandstone in volcanic rock 10,000 feet high. It stretches for 400 miles along the coast. North America's greatest mountain chain, the mighty Sierra Nevada, is forming, and the area that would become Yosemite is caught right in the middle of it. But some of this rising molten rock never makes it to the surface. Trapped beneath the blanket of mountains, it cools slowly, creating a giant chamber full of solidifying granite two miles below the surface. 400 miles long, 60 miles wide, and five miles deep, it stretches along the entire spine of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Yosemite's immense granite monoliths were forged in a fiery furnace two miles below ground. A hundred million years ago, I would have been standing in a vast chamber of molten rock with rock rising thousands of feet above me. Scientists investigating how the rocks at Yosemite formed have found 
Bands of granite, evidence Yosemite's rocks were once molten. And volcanic rocks, proof that the granite formed deep beneath the earth. But scientists were still mystified. Yosemite granite is so strong, it's unlike granite anywhere else on Earth. For hundreds of years, they tried to solve the mystery, while the answer was actually staring them in the face. Two hundred fifty million years ago, Yosemite's landscape was a peaceful coastal plain. Now the investigation moves to 100 million years ago. The land that would become Yosemite is in turmoil. Volcanoes dot the skyline, spilling mountains of lava onto the land. And entombed beneath two miles of volcanic rock lies Yosemite's molten granite. The next 10 million years is a critical period for the rocks of Yosemite. Something unique is happening to the granite, making it tough enough to hold up cliffs 3,000 feet high. The search for the secret of Yosemite granite's immense strength led scientists to the biggest steep-sided granite block in the world, the mighty El Capitan. Twice the height of the Empire State Building, over three billion cubic feet of rock rises into the air. El Capitan is the largest granite monolith in Yosemite National Park. 3,000 feet of pure granite. It's one of the biggest cliffs in the world. When I look up at something like this, I really want to hang onto the rock because I feel like I'm going to fall backwards with vertigo. Amazing. Capitan is the ultimate big wall climb. Once considered impossible to conquer, it's a treacherous ascent up a vertical, near featureless rock face with only a handful of roots to the summit. Sheer granite walls are normally unstable and over time get pulled down by erosion. So it was a mystery how rocks could hold up cliffs this big. Scientists are sampling the rocks to find out, but the Yosemite granite doesn't give in without a fight. Whew. These Yosemite granites are really hard. You can work up quite a sweat trying to collect a bag full of this stuff. Buried within this rock is the secret to Yosemite granite's success. Oh, finally. Well, one clue to why these rocks are so tough is given by this sample right here. These are really large crystals. Large crystals make a rock really strong. They kind of weld together, and they're flawless, and they give a rock a lot of strength. But it was a mystery how these tough crystals got so large and created such flawless rocks. This is in contrast to normal granite, which, when it cools, forms a hard rock with a fatal flaw. Riddled with cracks, these rocks are vulnerable to erosion. If you take anything and it's very hot and you cool it quickly, it'll shatter. And granite bodies that cool quickly and form a lot of cracks that weaken the rock body and make it unable to support 3,000-foot cliffs. If you walk up to a typical granite and look at it, you'll find cracks a foot apart, two feet apart. You walk up to El Capitan, you might have to go 100 feet or more between cracks in the rock. Clearly, something different happened here 100 million years ago. El Capitan is really just one large, uniform, essentially faultless piece of granite, and that makes it very difficult for erosion to deal with. For many years, it was a puzzle what had caused Yosemite granite to form so differently. But the secret had been staring scientists in the face. One of the things you can see is a clue as to how this landscape formed in that dark diagonal splotch. That's called the North American Wall because that dark blob looks like 
with some imagination, a map of North America, and you can kind of see Baja California sticking down on the left side there in Alaska up to the northwest. And it's made up of a much darker, finer grained rock like this. This dark granite is not just a map of North America. It's a window into the unique events that happened inside the Yosemite granite when it was buried deep beneath the earth. And it's a younger body of granitic rock that filled a crack within the main body of El Capitan granite. 100 million years ago, the main body of granite cools and begins to harden beneath the earth. But then fresh molten rock invades a crack and injects it with a blast of heat. The granite now takes 10 times longer to cool. Huge, robust crystals form and reseal the defective cracks. Time after time, fresh molten rock invades old, remelting and welding the Yosemite granite, creating gigantic shatterproof blocks which now tower thousands of feet into the air. Given that these are obviously very strong rocks, it, it, it puts the Whitney Muir controversy in an interesting light because Whitney wanted the rocks to have broken and for the valley to have fallen down in between a couple of major cracks. Muir wanted the whole thing to be carved by glaciers, and both of those seem really difficult given how strong these rocks are, and yet behind me here is a 3,000 foot deep valley. Something carved it. In the search to understand why Yosemite granite is so strong, scientists have found large granite crystals welded together to form a tough, flawless rock. And the North America wall, evidence that Yosemite granite was reheated time after time, creating huge, faultless blocks. 100 million years ago, Yosemite's granite lies buried beneath a volcanic mountain range two miles high. Rivers slice into this soft volcanic roof, gouging and washing it away. Then 60 million years ago, when dinosaurs are no more, the featureless lump of Yosemite granite is finally exposed to the elements. But Yosemite's ultra-tough granite defies attack. For another 50 million years, it remains unscathed. It would take a catastrophic event to chisel the 3,000-foot canyon out of one of the toughest rocks on Earth. Yosemite's Merced River meanders in a 3,000-foot canyon. But 250 million years ago, no vast canyon stood here. Yosemite is a flat coastal plain. It is blasted by volcanoes, and its granite is buried beneath two miles of volcanic rock. When the Yosemite granite is finally exposed, it is a shallow, run-of-the-mill river valley for a staggering 50 million years, it defies the destructive powers of erosion. If scientists were going to solve the mystery of how Yosemite Valley formed, they'd have to investigate the pivotal moment seven million years ago when a 3,000-foot canyon was suddenly chiseled into the granite, one of the toughest rocks on Earth. A clue to what almighty force overpowered the Yosemite granite lies high up on the exposed cliffs strange, deep cracks running for hundreds of feet through the rock. Yosemite's granites are strong, but they're not always strong. I'm standing on a fin of rock between two deep fissures. These cracks run right across the Yosemite landscape, and they clearly formed after the granite formed. And if I look at their orientation, they all go to the northeast. Strangely, Yosemite Valley is also oriented along the same northeast-southwesterly direction. Perhaps these cracks were the remnants of a cataclysmic rock-splitting event, as Josiah Whitney had predicted. A respected Yale-educated scientist, he passionately believed titanic forces beneath Yosemite had pulled the land apart, causing it to collapse along gigantic fault-line cracks. Could it be? that the argument was swinging in the bombastic Whitney's favor. 
And Muir's glacial theory was the rambling of an ignorant shepherd after all. Scientists searching for the answers as to how these giant cracks formed used modern technology to take a closer look at the ground beneath the Sierra Nevada. They did not find evidence of Whitney's cataclysmic rifting valley, but discovered a catastrophic event which had ramifications on a far greater scale. Seismic evidence has revealed that the Earth's crust is made of layers. The lighter outer shell forms the land, but fastened beneath is a dense anchor of sturdy rock. And beneath the Sierra Nevada, scientists discovered something extraordinary. A huge section of this lower crust, 200 miles long and 40 miles wide, is missing. This model represents the Sierra Nevada as it looked 10 million years ago. So the top here represents the mountain range. The bottom there, it represents the lower crust. Sometime in the past 10 million years, part of that lower crust disconnected from the mountain range and dropped away. The end result is that there was uplift of the Sierra Nevada because they were being held down by those dense rocks. So there was uplift of the Sierra Nevada, but because most of the route fell away to the east, the whole mountain range, rather than bobbing straight up, tilted to the west. Seven million years ago, a huge chunk of the lower crust suddenly drops away. The entire mountain chain snaps along its spine and tilts upward. Finally, here is a force capable of overcoming Yosemite's ultra-tough granite. As it snaps, the enormous pressure cracks the solid granite along the entire length of the mountain range. But it was a mystery how these cracks could give rise to a 3,000-foot deep canyon. Scientists realized some other force must have attacked the weakened, vulnerable granite. The hunt was on for an accomplice. And five miles downstream of Yosemite, at El Portal, they find it. Rapids. Here, Yosemite's meandering Merced River has transformed into a raging torrent. At times, 1,000 cubic feet of water gush through this narrow gorge every second, creating treacherous waves and turbulent eddies. So this is the Merced River, about five miles downstream of Yosemite Valley. It's extremely powerful. It's uh, a series of rapids and, and cascades over these boulders. And there's a lot of energy being expended by this river right now. Scientists realized this ferocious force, combined with the rock-weakening cracks, even had the power to cut into Yosemite's granite. The erosion of the river is focused right along the riverbed. And so it will cut down like a saw blade into the rock about the width of the river. So as it does that, it will come down and steepen the valley walls. Those, those walls will become unstable, and there'll be landslides into the river. The river will wash away the material, and uh, you'll be back to that V shape. Scientists realized if the Merced River created this deep V-shaped canyon, then it could also have cut a deep Yosemite Valley. Seven million years ago, as the Sierra Nevada tilts upwards, the mountain slope gets three times steeper, and the western flowing Merced River surges with a torrent of water. Like a saw blade, it zigzags along the path of weakened, cracked granite. In less than five million years, it cuts a 3,000-foot V-shaped canyon, running straight through the heart of Yosemite. Scientists investigating how Yosemite's deep canyon formed have discovered strange cracks in the rock, proof that the uplifting Sierra Nevada weakened the granite, and rapids downstream, evidence that the Merced River cut a deep V-shaped Yosemite canyon. But one part of the riddle remained unsolved. Yosemite's unique box-like shape some other extraordinary force had caused the canyon walls to collapse and the valley floor to flatten. The controversy about how this strange canyon formed raged on. 
Yosemite has had a turbulent past. 200 million years ago, its coastal plain is shattered by volcanoes. And then, Seven million years ago, the Merced River suddenly carves a deep V-shaped Yosemite Valley. For the next four million years, the river runs in this narrow canyon. But then, Yosemite is radically transformed again. About two and a half million years ago, when our ancestors were beginning to evolve in Africa, the V-shaped valley that was here began to evolve into the present valley floor, which is flat and is bounded by these vertical sheer rock walls on its side. It was during this second extraordinary stage of cliff formation that the most iconic rock in America formed, Half Dome. This natural wonder's unique shape has intrigued people for centuries. Its enormous granite dome is over three billion cubic feet in size, as large as 1,000 football stadiums. And its striking northwest face is a 2,000-foot vertical drop. In 1870, amateur geologist John Muir had a radical theory about how Half Dome and Yosemite's other vast cliffs formed. He believed that thousands of years ago, the Earth's temperature had plummeted and the valley had been filled with ice. You know, one thing that's important to keep in mind about, about John Muir, he didn't come up with this idea overnight. He was trekking, hiking, walking, going up to the tops of mountains. And the entire time he was doing this, he was listening, he was seeing, he was feeling, he was touching. And so he was slowly, letter by letter, word by word, learning the language of Yosemite. Muir knew from research in the European Alps that glaciers were capable of gouging out solid rock. As these great rivers of ice flow downhill, they press down on the canyon walls with a weight equal to 200 trucks per square yard, ripping out chunks of rock and causing the valley walls to get steeper. In general, glaciers transform a V-shaped valley that we see as characteristic of a river into a U-shaped valley by focusing their erosion on the valley walls rather than on the valley bottom until it has reached this U-shape, at which point it can then continue to erode as that U-shape. Muir knew that as a glacier flows, it grinds and polishes the bedrock with rough shards of rock lodged at its base. As they melt and disappear, glaciers leave behind U-shaped valleys and distinctive scratch marks. Muir proposed that giant rivers of ice also once flowed through Yosemite Valley. He hunted high and low for evidence of glacial scratch marks and eventually found a small 20-foot square patch of rock 30 feet from the valley floor. The granite has scratches on its surface. Each one of these scratches is associated with a rock embedded in the sole of a glacier. I can imagine Muir claiming that this is irrefutable evidence of glacial occupation of the valley floor. But if glaciers plowed down the valley, why weren't there millions of scratch marks on the cliffs? If Muir was correct, this is a picture of what happened. Two and a half million years ago, the temperature plummets. Yosemite Valley fills to the brim with a gigantic glacier. Only the tallest mountains peak above the sea of ice. For thousands of years, the glacier grinds away at the granite walls, scratching the cliffs and undercutting a peak that will become half dome. When it retreats, the glacier leaves precarious slabs of overhanging rock. The unstable rock face crashes to the valley floor. cleaving the great northwest face of Half Dome. In the same way, subsequent smaller glaciers cut away at the base of the valley for two million years, cleaving sheer vertical cliffs and removing all traces of glacial scratch marks. But there was still one glaringly obvious problem with Muir's theory, and arch enemy geologist Josiah Whitney pounced on it. If glaciers had carved the valley, why was Yosemite uniquely box-shaped?
and not U-shaped like a classic glacial valley. Whitney attacked Muir's theory and stubbornly declared this square, flat-bottomed valley could only have formed if the bottom had fallen out. Whitney hypothesized that instead of being carved by glaciers, that this was a fault-bounded valley, with the valley walls being faults down which the block in between the valley walls has dropped. In Whitney's theory, the flat valley floor would be the top of the down-dropped block. In the quest to unravel the mystery of Yosemite's flat-bottomed canyon, scientists are investigating the valley floor. The kinds of sediment that I see in this cut bank are coarse grains, pebbles, and sand, the same kind of rocks and sediment that the present stream can carry. In contrast to that, the deposit I see at my feet is very fine grain. Light, fine grain sediment like this is easily carried by flowing water. But when a river hits a body of still water, its energy levels slump and it dumps its load. This is the kind of sediment that we would expect to see on the floor of a lake. Further research has found similar strange sediments all over Yosemite. It's proof that 10,000 years ago, an ancient lake drowned this entire valley. Starting at the head of the canyon, it stretched for five miles through the landscape. But it was a mystery how Lake Yosemite had formed. Scientists scoured the valley looking for answers, and near the base of El Capitan, at the farthest end of the valley, they stumbled upon an insignificant-looking ridge. It's an important clue to how Lake Yosemite and the valley formed. This mound is made of an unusual collection of rocks, and it runs from one side of the valley to the other. Given this arc of a ridge is just down from El Cap, one might expect that it could have been caused from a rock fault. But if you look around, that's not the case. Clearly, even in this local area, we have rocks that came from at least three different places, no doubt, up the valley. This pink rock came from one portion of the valley. This gray granite came from another place. And this particular one, we can see the distinctive feldspars associated with the Cathedral Peaks granite. This strange distribution of rocks means that the ridge could not have formed from a catastrophic rock fall. Something else, just as epic, must have created it. This is a glacial moraine, the remnants of a glacier which once filled the valley. It's the conclusive evidence Muir had hoped for. Moraines form as glacial ice rips fragments of rock from the valley walls, carries them like a conveyor belt several miles downstream, and dumps the rubble at the mouth of the glacier. Scientists realize this ridge was also key to solving the mystery of how Lake Yosemite and the flat-bottomed valley floor formed. It wasn't just a moraine, it was a giant dam. It's two and a half million years ago, and glaciers grind through the valley. 10,000 years ago, the temperature rises and the glacier retreats. A huge moraine is dumped at the valley mouth, damming back the icy meltwater. The entire valley floods, creating an enormous Lake Yosemite. Mountain streams spill into this still water and dump ton after ton of fine sediment. The lake chokes with silt, creating Yosemite's distinctive flat-bottomed valley floor. We know from seismic evidence collected in the 1930s that it's 2,000 feet thick. That's enough sediment to cover New York City by a foot. And beneath this lake of sediment, they found the evidence that had always eluded Muir, a U-shaped basin, the hallmark of a classic glacial valley. It was indisputable evidence that Muir's intuitive observations and seemingly far-fetched theory were correct. 
And the final nail in the coffin for Whitney's theory of a cataclysmic rifting valley. Scientists trying to understand how the steep cliffs and flat bottom valley formed have found. Scratch marks, evidence that the sheer cliffs were carved by glaciers. And a glacial moraine, proof that an ancient Lake Yosemite filled with sediment and created the flat valley floor. For over two million years, the glaciers whittle away at Yosemite. Then 10,000 years ago, the glaciers retreat for good, leaving the one mile wide canyon we know today. But strange, dangerous forces are still exerting their powers on Yosemite's landscape with catastrophic consequences. Yosemite Valley has been sculpted by torrential water and thick slabs of ice. But today, another hidden force is shaping this magnificent landscape. It's 6.52 p.m., July 10th, 1996. Yosemite is hit by a catastrophic rockfall. Within minutes, a huge dust cloud of pulverized rock engulfs the valley. News spreads that Happy Isles, the busiest trail in the valley, has been decimated. Yosemite is in a state of emergency. When I got here, the devastation was really in full force. I saw trees that were just everywhere. The ambulances and chaos just was everywhere. People were running around screaming, and the whole area looked like a bomb had gone off. 80,000 tons of rock had suddenly dislodged from the cliff face. The weight of 1,600 trucks basically fell down. It hit and then exploded, and they created a wind blast. As strong as a tornado, the wind blast uprooted trees a half mile away from the impact zone. We can have about 3,000 people go up and down that trail in one day, and so we did not know how many people were trapped under the trees. And tragically, a young man was pinned by a tree and was killed, and a young woman was trapped under a tree and is paralyzed. A deadly, mysterious force is continually at work in Yosemite, causing the surface layers of the ultra-tough Yosemite granite to peel away in huge chunks. One large rockfall occurs every week in the park. And yet up to four million people visit Yosemite each year, getting perilously close to these potentially unstable cliffs. To discover what's causing Yosemite's incredibly tough granite to fall down, researchers have dotted vibration sensors and solar-powered seismic stations all over Yosemite's cliffs, enabling them to listen to the rocks. This computer allows me to see what's going on all the time. For example, if I throw this rock at the cliff over there, I just created a mini rock fall. And take a look. And these spikes are the rock hitting the cliff and then tumbling down. This is a mini rock fall that happened right here. So the station will pick up rock falls that happen that are small right here, but it'll pick up larger ones in other places. This seismic listening device has pinpointed a recent rockfall behind Half Dome. It's a chance for Valerie Zimmer to investigate why Yosemite's rocks are falling down. And all the evidence indicates another cataclysmic event has occurred. All right, look at this. All these trees have been knocked over like they're toothpicks. These rocks range from the size of a house to just dust. Analysis of the seismic data shows this was a massive rock fall, one of the biggest in the last 20 years. It shook the ground so hard it was the equivalent of a magnitude 2.4 earthquake. If you look up on that mountain, the amount of rocks that came down, you know, you look up high, it doesn't look like a big area, but it's deceivingly large. It's probably the size of maybe 40 houses altogether. Strangely, immediately above the scarred rock face, a new dome is forming. Mm -hmm. 
Mysterious domes are forming all over the valley. The most famous, Half Dome. Glaciers cleaved its vertical face, but its dome top has been shrouded in mystery. A strange underlying force is sculpting these peaks into domes, causing the rocks to tumble down. North of Yosemite, on the dome at Olmsted Point, it's possible to get close enough to investigate why the surface layers of granite are shattering. These domes are all over the place. I see these layers running parallel to the surface. They're almost like the layers of an onion. And the layers are starting to peel off. In fact, look right here. This one is coming apart. The outer surface of the rock has fractured into layers running over the summit and down the sides of the dome. These are weaknesses in the rock. It's obvious that there must be some sort of force that's causing the rock to break in this way and peel apart like an onion. The only force capable of fracturing the ultra-tough Yosemite granite like this originates deep within the Earth. 100 million years ago, the Yosemite granite is beginning to form. Submerged beneath two miles of volcanic rock, it's squashed and squeezed from every direction. Over the next 40 million years, the volcanic roof erodes away. The immense downward pressure is removed, leaving these titanic forces out of balance. The surface of the exposed Yosemite granite is now an avenue through which this pent-up pressure can be released. The granite is still being squeezed from the sides and from the bottom, but at the surface it's free to move. What happens is these layers start to open up parallel to the surface. The release of this ancient pressure causes the surface of the granite to fracture into onion layers, which then peel away. And so when the tops of those mountains fall off, you're left with rounded domes. But it's not just the granite peaks that are affected. It's the cliffs, too. These layers will also form if the ground surface is vertical, like a cliff, creating vertical fractures alongside the cliff. These vertical fractures allow the rock to then slide out and create rock falls. And this is one of the major contributing factors to rock falls in Yosemite. Yosemite's catastrophic rock falls are the legacy of its prehistoric birth beneath the earth 100 million years ago. The gradual release of this ancient pent-up pressure has created an untamed and dynamic landscape. Rockfall is a natural process and is part of the ongoing evolution of Yosemite National Park. I always get a little bit tickled when people ask me questions like, what are you going to do to prevent future rockfalls? It's a constant reminder that this is a wild place and that there's nothing we can do or should do to tame it in any way, shape or form, but it's something that after I'm long gone will continue to happen. For the last 150 years, scientists have been figuring out how this magnificent valley formed. They found volcanic rocks, proof that the molten granite cooled deep beneath the earth. Large crystals, evidence that Yosemite granite cooled slowly, creating tough, faultless rock. Rapids downstream show that the Merced River cut a deep V-shaped canyon and rocks carried by a glacier, conclusive evidence that ice carved Yosemite's steep cliffs and flattened its valley floor. Yosemite, a valley of giants, is a geological masterpiece. The unique strength of its near-perfect granite has created some of the most imposing and iconic landscapes on planet Earth one where the deep earth forces that created it are continuing to shape its future. Living proof that the earth is never at rest. Earth, a unique planet, restless and dynamic. Continents shift and clash. Volcanoes erupt, glaciers grow Seed. Titanic forces that are constantly at work, leaving a trail of geological mysteries behind. 
In this episode, we investigate the formation of the Rockies, a North American mountain range shrouded in mystery. Flanked by huge slabs of rocks with ancient sea fossils buried high in its slopes and crowned by jagged peaks that geologists believe were once double the height they are today. Scientists piecing together their story uncover evidence of massive ice sheets, collapsing mountains, and explosive volcanic eruptions. A geological history that brings us one step closer to understanding how the Earth was made. The Rockies, a majestic mountain range towering high above the American West. It's the longest chain in North America and the third longest in the world, stretching over 3,000 miles from New Mexico through Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana, and north into Canada. For decades, geologists have been puzzled about how this giant mountain range rose from the plains. The investigation begins with a specific type of rock. Here we are in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. We're in an amazing place to begin with. And right here at Red Rocks, we're in the midst of an amphitheater of rock. Thirteen miles west of Denver, Colorado, two 300-foot-high sandstone monoliths slope 45 degrees into the sky. Each is taller than Niagara Falls. Together, they form the walls of a unique musical venue. But there is more to these rocks than fine acoustics. These rocks tell the story of how the Rocky Mountains were made. The story begins with a mystery, 8,000 feet high in the Colorado Rockies, 60 miles northwest of Boulder. All kinds of strange impressions are found in rocks scattered over the landscape. We find more than 100 species of marine animals uh, right here at this site. We find sharks, we find lobsters, crabs, we find beautiful fossil clams, which are all over the place. These fossils are crucial evidence of what existed here before the Rockies emerged. We're sitting at about 8,000 feet in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. And so when these fossils were formed, this was below the level of the ocean. This was below sea level. This area was covered by a vast inland sea. It existed for over 30 million years and stretched from Utah to Missouri and from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Sea. And at this very site, it would have been very warm, almost tropical. And so envision maybe a day on the beach in Florida or something like that. This warm climate attracted a unique type of creature that left behind large, round imprints in the rocks. These fossils would play an important part in the investigation. This fossil here is a giant fossil ammonite. And this animal, this coiled shell right here, is a relative of modern-day squids. So the closest living relatives today are squids, nautiloids, octopuses, things like that. And so in this big coiled shell here, the animal would have lived at this end, and its tentacles would have stretched out right here. And this animal is really quite remarkable. It's about the size of a truck tire. And this is incredible because most ammonites aren't this big. Nowhere else have scientists found a greater number of these prehistoric creatures than here. Miller has come up with a theory why so many of them came to this area. We think this particular uh, fossil here was a female ammonite. And we think that in part because male squids are smaller than female squids by a lot. So just looking around the fossil deposits here, we found a male ammonite, this small one here. So compare the size of this guy to this very big one here. And when we look across this landscape, we find mostly these big ammonites. And so we think that maybe all these females got together to spawn and then died after they spawned. When the ammonites became extinct, the map of North America looked completely different. To the north, the Canadian Rocky Mountains already existed. To the south, the American Rockies had yet to rise. 
the date of the Ammonites' extinction holds a key to when they first emerged. These animals died about 70 million years ago in the middle of the Western Interior Seaway. And so we know at that time, about 70 million years ago, that this site was below sea level. So we know then that the Rocky Mountains had to rise from that seaway sometime after 70 million years ago. Today, all that is left from the ancient sea floor are these fossilized remains high in the Colorado Rockies. Next, geologists needed to find out what pushed the seafloor up. The investigation moves to these slabs of rock flanking the Rockies just outside Denver, Colorado. They are known as the Flatirons, and they are part of the same formation that make up the Red Rocks Amphitheater. These slabs of rock are unusual because they contain holes, holes that make the flat irons appealing to climbers and geologists alike. So when we go climbing in the flat irons, we're climbing on really nice handholds. In some cases, handholds that have been formed either by the pebbles in the rock or by zones of fine-grained material that are easily removed by erosion, the shales and the siltstones. Those layers get removed leaving a notch for the hands to go in, and it makes for fantastic climbing. The holes are a clue as to how these strangely tilted flat irons were formed. The layers themselves, the different grain sizes in the layers, the silt, the sand, the pebbles, this tells us that these are sedimentary rocks. Sediments form in water when sand and small pieces of rock settle on the ground. Over millions of years, they get compressed into layers of rock. Taking a closer look, Lester can find out more about the surroundings they formed in. These were not just deposited in any kind of sedimentary situation, but they were deposited in rivers capable of transporting big particles and busting them up as it goes along. Sheets of sand and gravel built up a thick sedimentary bed, like a layered cake. But stream deposits are rarely more than a few degrees from horizontal. These rocks, you can see the layers, and the layers in the flat irons behind me are 60 degrees. Something caused these vast slabs to be tilted. The investigation moves 10 miles northeast to Flagstaff Mountain, located in the outer ranges of the Colorado Rockies. I'm standing here right next to a miniature flat iron. It's tilted like the flat irons at about 60 degrees. It's steep. How'd it get that way if it was originally a stream gravel deposit? The answer lies in the darker rock underneath. It is granite and looks completely different to the flat iron rock above. There's no layering in this rock, unlike the flat iron rock, which does have layering. There's no pebbles in this rock, unlike the flat iron rock, which does have pebbles. A close-up investigation of the granite reveals that it is full of minerals. This offers another clue to how the Rockies emerged. So I've picked up this granite here, and taking a look at it, I see quartz and feldspar and a little bit of mica in here, very characteristic of a rock like this that has cooled from a magma, from a liquid rock. Among the minerals is iron. It is responsible for the dark color of the rock. The precise quantity of iron tells scientists the depth at which the rock was formed. So we've taken this rock into the laboratory and we do the chemistry on this rock, and we can actually determine that not only did it cool and crystallize at depth, that depth we can estimate at about 15 miles down. It's now at the surface. How did it get here? It's been pushed up by the rise of the Rocky Mountains, and in doing so, look what it's done to the flat iron. Scientists investigating the Rocky Mountains have found two clues about their early history. Ammonites on a site 8,000 feet high are evidence that the area was once under the sea. Traces of iron in granite is evidence that rock pushed up from 15 miles below the surface 
tilting the flat irons. And it didn't just happen here, but along approximately a thousand miles of the American Rockies. Geologists now needed to find out what monumental forces were responsible for this massive upheaval. One hundred million years ago, most of North America was covered by a vast inland sea. Seventy million years ago, the sea retreated, and the Rocky Mountains began to rise, forming a great mountain range. Scientists trying to piece together their geological past needed to solve the mystery of what lifted them up. A force capable of that amount of heavy lifting would have to have been on a global scale. Geologists believe this force was caused by plate tectonics. The Earth's crust is broken up into a series of interlocking plates. These plates are continuously on the move. Over millions of years, they collide and break apart, forming new continents and geological features around the world. When the Rockies formed, two of these plates smashed into each other at the American West Coast. What we know is that at the time of this granite uplift, on the western margin of North America, ocean crust, an oceanic plate, was subducting beneath the North American plate. And it was doing so at a high rate of speed. As such, it was transferring stress into the interior of the continent. As the two plates moved towards each other, they squeezed the crust. Over millions of years, it folded and buckled, forming tall mountains. This was the birth of the American Rockies. But a mystery remained. How did the collision of two tectonic plates at the western edge of North America cause the rise of the Rockies 500 to 1,000 miles inland? Mountain ranges that form on the margins of continents are pretty easy to explain or where continents have collided. Where India slams into Asia, we get the Himalayas. Where oceanic crust dives beneath the continental margin in the Northwest, the Cascades, or in South America, the Andes Mountains. But these mountains here, in the middle of a continent, are much harder to explain, and they've been an enigma for decades. Only recently, geologists have come up with a plausible theory. They suspect the Rockies formed along a line where the crust is very fragile. What happens when the continent gets compressed, especially if there's a weak zone or a zone that's prone to buckling? It rises. That's what's brought this granite to the surface. Geologists now understood how the Rockies rose, and they had a date for when it happened. But what were these early mountains like? How do they compare to the mountains of today? On a site in the Rockies, 70 miles northwest of Denver, geologists find a clue. Mountains that we see here today aren't the mountains that were around millions of years ago. They're always evolving. Rivers are shifting, peaks are shifting. It's a very dynamic process. It's almost as if the mountains are alive themselves. Miller sets out to estimate the height of the early mountains. But how can you measure something that is no longer there? Once more, fossils provide the evidence he is looking for. What's amazing about collecting fossils is that you're really the first person to see this when you crack open a rock. It's the first time it sees light again after 60 million years. Miller has uncovered a 60 million year old fossilized leaf. It's from a tree that grew here just 10 million years after the Rockies began to form. And intriguingly, this leaf holds a clue to the height of these early mountains. Or more precisely, it's the edges of the leaf, known as leaf margins. Botanists know that in colder temperatures, the margins tend to have more teeth than leaves that grow in warmer areas. Leaves with teeth do better in colder climates because teeth are actually really advantageous in jump-starting growth at the beginning of the growing seasons. In this case, you can see this beautiful fossil leaf here with teeth, and each of the teeth are little hotbeds of photosynthesis. So when that leaf first comes out of the bud, it gets a jump start on leaves that don't have teeth. Miller uses this information to find out about the height of the young Rocky Mountains. In a simple but powerful technique, 
he compares the number of leaves with teeth to those without. If you go to a particular area and you pick up all the species of leaves that are there from the trees that are growing in that area, and you compare the number of species that have teeth to the number of species that have smooth margins, that gives us some idea of what the temperature is. So the higher the proportion of plants with jagged edges compared to plants with smooth edges, the colder the temperature of the site. And the colder the temperature, the higher the mountain. So if you got into a hot air balloon here today and you floated straight up into the atmosphere, the temperature would decrease in a very predictable way. And it turns out that for about every mile you go up in the atmosphere, you lose about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we know how temperature changes with elevation, we can back out elevation from those estimates of temperature. To work out the height of the early mountain, Miller needs to compare samples from two areas, one at the base of the mountain and one at the top. Fossils found at the base of the Rockies near to present-day Denver have an amazing story to tell. These ancient leaves are incredibly similar to plants growing in the tropics today. So after the Rockies rose, down in the area of Denver, it was subtropical and tropical forests. We had palms and cycads and canopies like we see in the tropics today. Up here, we had a forest that looked probably more like a forest that grows in North or South Carolina on the east coast of the US. By comparing the ancient fossil leaves from the top of the mountain with fossil leaves from the foot of the mountain, Miller has come up with a surprising conclusion. It turns out that the fossil leaves here are predominantly toothed, as compared to those that are in Denver, which are predominantly smooth margin. And it turns out the ones in Denver grew in a climate that was about, on average, about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The ones up here grew in a climate that was probably about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we know how temperature changes with elevation, that means that this site when these fossil leaves were deposited was about a mile higher than Denver. Today, it's only a half a mile higher. So 60 million years ago, the mountains would be twice as high as they are today. After the Rockies emerged from the sea, it took them 10 million years to rise. 60 million years ago, they reached spectacular heights of 28,000 feet, rivaling the Himalayas today. The deep history of the Rocky Mountains is beginning to take shape. A weak line in the crust explains why the Rockies rose 500 to 1,000 miles inland. Fossil leaves show that the young Rocky Mountains were once nearly twice their size. Half of the rock that formed them originally has vanished. Scientists are now trying to unravel the processes that cut them down to the size they are today. million years ago, a vast inland sea covered the area where the American Rockies stand tall today. 70 million years ago, the sea retreated as the Rockies began to rise. 60 million years ago, the Rocky Mountains reached their pinnacle, towering into the sky with peaks over 28,000 feet high, rivaling the Himalayas. Since then, the entire mountain range has lost nearly half its height Geologists investigating the history of the Rockies are trying to discover what happened to the billions of tons of rock that went missing. The investigation starts with a mystery at the Owl Creek Mountains in the Wyoming Rockies. The mountains are sliced by a river that has formed a deep canyon. Well, the Wind River is very perplexing. Um, it chose to take a straight path right through the core of a major mountain range. Uh, this is not the way that rivers normally act. Usually they'll take the easiest route, which is downhill. But this river cut right through a major mountain range and has been a mystery. It is a very perplexing issue to early geologists in the region. This river led to confusion as early as 1806, when Meriwether Lewis and William Clark mapped the area during their famous expedition to explore uncharted territory in the West. When they came to the area around the Owl Creek Mountains, 
they assumed there were two rivers. North of the mountain flowed a river which they named Bighorn, thinking it was different to Wind River in the south. But later surveys showed that the Bighorn and Wind River are in fact one river that channeled through the mountain. Recently, geologists have come up with a possible answer, an answer that could also explain what happened to the once towering peaks of the Rockies. They proposed that millions of tons of rock eroded away, filled in the valleys, and covered the lower parts of the mountains. It completely changed the terrain. At one point in ancient history, the basins in Wyoming were filled with sediments that had eroded off the mountains. This allowed the river to be at a higher plane and meander wherever it wanted to on its course. As the water flowed, it carved deep into the sediments and rock underneath. Eventually, it cut down a channel into the mountain and eventually excavated right through the mountain. But this is just a theory. Now, geologists needed to find proof on the ground. The search is on for the rock that eroded from the early Rockies. The investigation moves to a series of thousand-foot-tall hills in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. Known as the Pumpkin Buttes, they stand tall in an otherwise wide, empty landscape. Hidden behind the horizon are the Bighorn Mountains, the nearest range of the Rockies. These hills are not formed from solid rock, but a collection of rubble. This rock, which we find all over the top of Pumpkin Buttes in Wyoming, is a granite. The closest granite we find to this area is the Bighorn Mountains, nearly 100 miles to the west. The round shape of the granite rocks is further proof that they traveled from afar. Tumbling downhill in rivers and landslides rounded them on their journey over millions of years. This was a crucial step in the investigation tracing the missing rock from the early Rockies. Rock and cobbles eroded down from the Bighorn Mountains and filled up the basin to at least a thousand feet, the height of the Pumpkin Buttes. Pumpkin Buttes are unique because this used to be the actual surface level of the basin itself. Um, the rest has been eroded away a thousand feet of sediment to the basin that we see now. But the rubble found here is nowhere near enough to have covered the Owl Creek Mountains. McLaughlin traveled to Darton's Peak, 100 miles west in the Bighorn Mountains. On a cliff 9,000 feet high, he finds granitic cobbles that are strikingly similar to the ones on the Pumpkin Buttes. They, too, are from the core of the Rocky Mountains. The core of the Rocky Mountains are made extensively of granite. Much like what you see here, um, these are from the bighorns that have been transported down, rolled, and smoothed along their way to, to create these smaller boulders and cobbles. This is strong evidence that cobbles eroding from the Rockies filled in the basins and valleys to at least 9,000 feet, slowly burying the mountains under their own debris. Where once the mighty Rockies stood, there was now a gray, barren plain, with only the peaks of the old mountains piercing the surface. The same process has happened in other mountain chains, too. There is evidence that the European Alps were also cut in half by erosion. At their base, scientists found hills formed out of millions of tons of rock that had cascaded down and reduced their height. But the story of the eroding Rockies wasn't over yet. After erosion turned the landscape into a gray cobble field, another disruption happened. Evidence for this is a layer covering the top of the cobbles. It's very light, it's very fine-grained. It's actually a volcanic ash, as you can see. It's made of very, very fine-grained sediments compared to this boulder conglomerate, which is made of big hunks of rock. 
It sits directly on top of this unit and it was laid horizontally from mostly asphalt. This fine-grained ash suggests huge volcanic eruptions nearby. They spewed out thick clouds of hot air, ash, and volcanic rock, which settled on the ground. Radiocarbon dating the rock revealed that it happened 25 million years ago. Ash was deposited as it came out of the sky as plumes. Most of it came from the west and was deposited in um, basins across Wyoming. After the lower Rockies were buried by their own rock, volcanic ash settled on top and covered the area with a thick white sheet. At the time of the deepest basin fill of this volcanic material, all you would see in this area would be the very tops of the peaks exposed. The rest would be large, extensive lateral ash sheets. Erosion and volcanism completely transformed the terrain and buried the Rockies. But then, over millions of years, rivers flushed out the eroded rock. Most of it is thought to have ended up in the Missouri and Mississippi rivers from where it was transported into the sea. What's left are the mountains we see today. This also confirmed the theory geologists had about the formation of Wind River Canyon. The incredible amount of infill buried the Owl Creek Mountains. Wind River flowed on top and began carving into the mountains, creating the canyon we see today. The investigation into what happened to the early Rocky Mountains reveals two major clues. Granite found on the Pumpkin Buttes is evidence that the early Rockies dumped their eroded rock into the basins. Wind River Canyon Cutting straight through the Owl Creek Mountains is evidence that the Rockies were buried by their own debris. The once mighty Rockies had now been cut down to nearly half their original size. But the story was far from over. Before they became the mountains we know today, they would have to endure an even greater assault. Seventy million years ago, a great inland sea disappeared and the Rocky Mountains emerged from the sea floor. Sixty million years ago, they reached their peak height, twice what it is today. Then, for millions of years, the Rockies slowly eroded away to half their original height until three million years ago, another dramatic chapter in their story began that would transform them into the mountains we know today. Geologist and photographer Bob Anderson takes to the air. He is looking for clues that will tell him how the mountains have evolved. First, he flies over Boulder Canyon in the Colorado Rockies. It is an area that has remained almost unchanged over millions of years. So this is Boulder Canyon we're flying up right now, and you can see how the river has incised maybe a few hundred feet down into otherwise relatively rolling terrain. The mountain peaks that existed on the young Rocky Mountains were rounded off as rivers and streams eroded the rock. It's this rolling terrain that, that the landscape looked like in the aftermath of the mountain building event that ended about 50 million years ago. But as Anderson climbs higher to Long's Peak in the Rocky Mountain National Park, the terrain changes. Instead of rolling hills, there are rugged mountains with steep, jagged cliffs. It's evidence that another force has been at work. The most famous of these cliffs is the Diamond. Named for its shape, it's a vertical wall with a sheer 900-foot drop. The summit, about 45,000 square feet, is the same size as a football field. Well, we're flying beside uh, Long's Peak, one of the biggest climbing challenges in the Rockies. First century, it's been a climbing mecca. It's a gorgeous 
intact piece of rock. This awesome wall is the most difficult climb in the whole of the Rockies, and since it was officially opened to climbers in 1960, has claimed over 50 lives. Back on the ground, Anderson is looking for evidence that will reveal the processes that shaped the jagged peaks. On a hillside, he finds mysterious large boulders scattered across the valley floor. A closer look uncovers some secrets about their origin. Well, I'm standing in front of a rounded boulder that itself is sitting on a smooth uh, bedrock outcrop. Both the boulder and the outcrop are covered in lichen here of green to black to gray colors. And therefore, I had to uh, whack off a piece of the rock in order to see inside the rock. And indeed, it is different. The minerals that I see and the texture of the rock is different from the underlying rock. And therefore, the rock is a, a foreign to this particular site. Anderson searches the ground for more clues as to how this massive boulder got here. Nearby, he finds a smooth surface with very fine scratch marks. I'm sitting on a polished surface. Uh, this little piece right here is smooth to the touch. And if I look at it in a certain way that the uh, light glints off of it just right, I can see that there are scratches running in this direction across the surface. The only force that could have produced these fine parallel scratches on the rock is ice. And lots of it. It's a clue that a massive glacier once filled this valley. And that tells me that the glacier came down valley, came across this surface, and eroded it. Each one of these scratches corresponds to a sand grain embedded in the sole of the ice that, just like sandpaper, smooths off the surface. So zillions of sand grains over thousands of years will have eroded this surface smooth. As glaciers flowed down the valley, they picked up rocks and grit. The ice pushed down on these cutting tools with the weight of over a 1,000 fully loaded garbage trucks. It left scratch marks all over the Rockies up to a 1,000 feet high. This is evidence that a massive wall of ice covered this part of the Rockies and shaped the mountains. The ice ripped out the rock from the valley walls and left behind the jagged cliffs and rugged edges. For the last few million years, perhaps three million years, glaciers have come and gone from the Rocky Mountains. And every time they come across the landscape, they're capable of eroding that landscape at rates that are perhaps fractions of an inch per year. Meaning that over the course of one glacial uh, cycle, you perhaps erode 10, 20 feet of rock. Ice also created the broad canyons. With every ice age, new glaciers ground their way down V-shaped river valleys and turned them into broad U-shaped canyons. For the glacier, the whole valley is its channel. So any place where the glacier touches the wall, it's capable of eroding it. And therefore, the, the walls will be made more vertical on the edges and be flattened on the, on the base until it gets to now a U-shape which then propagates downward. Ice also explains the presence of these boulders. They hitchhiked at the bottom of a glacier down the frozen valley. When the last ice age came to an end and the glaciers melted about 10,000 years ago, the boulders were left behind. Scientists had found two pieces of evidence that were responsible for the jagged looks of the Rockies today. A solitary boulder foreign to the area could have only been transported here by ice. Striations showed scientists that a glacier at least a thousand feet thick covered the Rockies. Ice was responsible for the dramatic shape of the Rockies today. But the mountains keep evolving Recently, scientists discovered alarming evidence that they may collapse into a deep rift.
For the last 70 million years, compression, erosion, and ice have sculpted the Rocky Mountains to their present formation. But the geology that created this impressive mountain range has also the potential to destroy it. Over the last 25 million years, a gigantic rift has been opening up at the southern end of the Rocky Mountains. It stretches over 160,000 square miles and is known as the Rio Grande Valley. Geologists are eager to investigate how this giant rifting valley could affect the future of the Rockies. They find their first lead in San Isidro, New Mexico, north of Albuquerque. The area is dominated by bright yellow porous rock known as travertines. Curiously, geologists think this rock forms from water. This water has some uh, unusual characteristics. That is, this, this water is capable of precipitating or depositing a new rock called travertine. It's like, kind of like the scale in your teapot. Travertine rock is made out of calcite, the same material that builds up lime scale. These rocks grow very rapidly, some enlarge by a few inches per month. About a liter of the water will be able to drop out or precipitate a little pile of calcite about as big as an aspirin tablet. Like lime scale building up in a hot water kettle, travertines form around warm springs. Measurements confirm that water temperature around the travertines is roughly 77 degrees. Besides the ability to build rock, this hot water has more secrets to tell. Laura Crossy and Carl Karlstrom have a hunch that the water is warmed up by heat from the Earth's interior, rising up through cracks in the rock. They form as the rift valley pulls apart. Climbing down a cave 25 feet below the surface, they are hoping to find further evidence. The water contains microbes. They are microscopically small organisms. Most of them consist of only one cell. When scientists analyzed their genes in the lab, they found something remarkable. What we found in springs like this by doing the DNA analysis is that the microbes that are coming up these faults are much more like what we find at mid-ocean ridges than like the rivers and streams we would expect in a continental setting. Mid-ocean ridges are very long mountain chains under the sea. Just like the Rift Valley, they also form in geologically active areas where lava constantly erupts and builds up new crust. Any living organism surviving down there has to be able to cope with these hot conditions. The springs here and the mid-ocean ridge settings are also characterized by the upwelling of deep hot fluids from within the Earth, indicating that these both are connected to that deep tectonic setting. The microbes suggest deep tectonic forces are at work, but there is even more compelling evidence. Karlstrom and Crossy find an unusually high amount of gas bubbling up through the water. These samples are kind of fun because it looks like an empty glass vial, but it started out full of water, and then we filled up the, turned it upside down in the water, and the gas displaced the water until it's full of gas. A lab analysis identifies the gas as helium. This is the conclusive evidence that deep tectonic forces are at work here. The helium is the, uh, is the interesting, most interesting gas for us. It's the smoking gun of evidence for, for where these fluids have come from. There's two forms of helium, but it's the helium-3 that we're most interested in, and that form of helium is only derived from the Earth's mantle. The mantle is a part of the Earth's interior, 30 miles below the surface. It is made up of hot, molten rock. In areas where magma moves up, pressure on top of it decreases and gases such as helium are released. They find their way through faults and cracks until they reach the surface. So helium gas is conclusive proof that geological forces deep under the Earth are building up. And the effect it will have on the Rockies is devastating. 
the Rio Grande Rift is an area that's uh, tectonically active in a different way than you think of building of mountains. This area is the next stage in, in the life sometimes of a mountain belt where it starts to collapse, it starts to extend. As hot magma surges upwards from 30 miles below the surface, it forces the area on top to spread. The surface stretches and thins and opens up a deep chasm. As the rift opens, the mountains to each side crumble into the valley. You can think of a piece of taffy that's being stretched and it might break on the top and those breaks would lower uh, pieces of the, they would drop down. And then once you have a, uh, what's called a fault valley, then the sediments wash in from the high mountains. It's an immense structure. It's, it's about six miles deep. It's about as deep as Mount Everest is high. But it, it's, when you drive across it or you look at it uh, from uh, any vantage point, it's, you don't see that entire uh, depth because it's all been filled with sand and gravel progressively as the extension took place. Today, the Rio Grande Rift stretches over 160,000 square miles from Mexico in the south, where it's broadest, to Colorado in the north, where it's only just begun to open up. This rift is propagating northwards into the higher Colorado Rockies. What's going to happen to Colorado, those mountains will probably collapse uh, by rifting as the rift propagates, zippers northward. And you can, you can visualize that what's now in Colorado is more similar to what was in New Mexico before the Rio Grande Rift opened and before the mountains uh, collapsed. Looking ahead in the distant future, there could be challenging times. The tectonic forces that created the Rockies could eventually lead to their destruction. When we think about the great continental rifts, uh, East African and Rio Grande Rift, the question arises, is the continent going to split apart here? Is this, if this rifting carries on, are we going to have beachfront property uh, right here in New Mexico? And the realtors are very interested in this, but so are the geologists. The formation of the Rocky Mountains is a remarkable story. 70 million years ago, the death of ancient Ammonites marked the rise of the Rocky Mountains from the retreating inland sea. 60 million years ago, leaves with jagged margins grew on the mountains that were twice as high as today. 10,000 years ago, a solitary boulder marked the retreat of the last glacier that sculpted the Rockies. And helium gas in the Rio Grande Valley today is a clue that the area deep under the surface is active again. If rifting continues and the Rio Grande Valley widens, the area of the Rocky Mountains could one day rip apart. A new sea would move in, like the vast inland sea that covered the area 70 million years ago. The Rocky Mountains, the great backbone of North America, would slowly disappear, and the continent would once more split, living proof that the Earth is never at rest. Earth, a unique planet, restless and dynamic. Continents shift and clash. Volcanoes erupt. Glaciers grow and recede. Titanic forces that are constantly at work, leaving behind a trail of geological mysteries. One of Earth's most intriguing mysteries is the presence of a huge arc of geological destruction surrounding the Pacific. It is known as the Ring of Fire. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes are situated here, and 90% of all earthquakes also occur along this line. Over the last 200 years, disasters here have claimed over one million lives. scientists set out to discover why these volcanoes and quakes occur all around the margins of the Pacific Ocean and to find out what powers them. 
Unlocking the mysteries of this awesome force of geology will bring the scientists one step closer to understanding how the Earth was made. The Ring of Fire is one of the most extensive zones of destruction on planet Earth. Its most visible features are the hundreds of volcanoes that line the shores of the Pacific Ocean. They form an arc which extends 25,000 miles from South America along America's northwest coast to Alaska and then down through Russia, Japan, and Southeast Asia, all the way to New Zealand. Cataclysmic eruptions have occurred here throughout history. August 1883, Indonesia. The Krakatoa volcano blew itself to pieces, creating the loudest sound in recorded history. June 1991, the Philippines. Mount Pinatubo blasted debris 22 miles into the atmosphere. Suffocating ash swamped over 2,500 square miles. And in May 1980, Mount St. Helens caused $1 billion of damage. The ever-present threat from these volcanoes makes it essential for scientists to understand the forces that power them. The investigation begins here, in Alaska. This land of rugged beauty marks the most northern extreme of the Ring of Fire. 75% of all the volcanoes in the United States are situated in Alaska, making it a perfect laboratory for volcanologists. The first step is to discover how the Ring of Fire's giant volcanoes form. volcano, which um, lies in Cook Inlet, and it's a uh, part of the chain of volcanoes that extends all the way down into the Aleutian Islands. It's a 60-mile journey out across the frigid Alaskan water. In the distance, the volcano soon appears. There's the Augustine Volcano over there. It's going to be a perfect day to visit. From high above the clouds, Dr. Bull can gain a clear view of the volcano's distinctive outline. Augustine is a stratovolcano, the type of volcano found all around the Ring of Fire. Stratovolcanoes are quite unique in that they are shaped as beautiful cones, and Augustine is a perfect example of that. Augustine last exploded in January 2006 the most recent of seven eruptions here since 1935. Over the years, solidified lava flows have gradually built up on the volcano's flanks. To investigate what makes these volcanoes so dangerous, Dr. Bull climbs high up on the side of one of these lava flows. This lava is uh, made up of blocks. There's bits that are a uh, little denser than others and you can see there's a lot of different pieces to it so we call this a blocky lava flow this blocky lava provides a crucial clue as to why the ring of fire volcanoes can be so deadly this lava is more thick when it comes out of the volcano and its thickness will have an effect on how it runs down the slope. The thickness or viscosity of lavas can be shown um, in a number of ways. Hawaii lavas are quite runny. Honey is a perfect example of that. If you have the volcano putting out Hawaii-like lava, it's gonna run quite easily down the rock. Whereas if you have something more like these blocky lavas, they're gonna be a little bit more like peanut butter. They'll still run, but the viscosity is much greater. The viscosity of lava is primarily determined by the amount of silica it contains. 
Silica is the most abundant mineral in Earth's crust. The more silica, the thicker or more viscous a lava is likely to be. Hawaiian lava contains little silica, so it's runny and produces a relatively flat landscape. But ring of fire lavas are rich in silica, making them sticky and less able to flow, creating tall, cone-shaped stratovolcanoes. During the 2006 eruption of Augustine, thermal imaging cameras were used to study the volcano. They showed this sticky lava building up layer upon layer. But the thickness of this lava also makes these volcanoes lethal. Because these volcanoes have lava that is thick, things don't move through them very well. And bubbles of gases can build up. Deep in the earth, under immense pressure, molten rock called magma contains dissolved gas. But as this magma rises, the pressure decreases. This drop in pressure means bubbles of the gas begin to appear, just like opening a bottle of soda. If the magma is runny, these gases can safely escape. But in sticky, silica-rich ring-of-fire magma, the gases can get trapped, often with terrible consequences. It's like trying to have a bubble move through peanut butter. It won't happen quite so easily. So there's a lot of pressure that builds up. And once that pressure builds up, it reaches a point where it can't take all that pressure anymore. The result? Giant explosions caused by the catastrophic buildup of gas inside the molten rock. This is the reason Ring of Fire volcanoes can be so dangerous. But it's not usually the initial explosion that kills. It's what happens next. Those explosive eruptions can create plumes that go up for tens of miles. When these plumes run out of energy, they can collapse back down the sides of the volcano in a superheated avalanche of ash and gas. With temperatures of 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit and speeds over 100 miles per hour, these flows destroy everything in their path. A terrifying consequence of the explosive eruptions caused by gases building up inside thick lava. In the next stage of her investigation, Dr. Bull searches for clues as to how this sticky lava forms. On Augustine's lower slopes, she hunts for lava samples from inside the volcano. This giant block of solidified sticky lava was once molten magma deep underground. It was blasted out here during an eruption, and it came with some intriguing evidence. So what I'm seeing in this rock is a lot of minerals and a little bit in some cases of hornblende. The presence of these hornblende crystals provides a crucial clue to how the magma formed. This is important in telling us something about magma conditions where the hornblende crystallized. Hornblende is a mineral that only forms in the presence of water. These hornblends show water exists deep in the earth. Scientists suspect this water plays a crucial role in creating the magma that powers volcanoes. Deep underground, rocks are hot and semi-solid. It might seem that the presence of water would cool them down. But that's not what happens. This water, which is under huge pressure, alters the rock's structure and causes them to melt, forming plumes of magma. This molten rock soars up to the surface, building giant volcanoes. Without water causing magma formation deep underground, these ring of fire volcanoes would simply not exist. A lot of this process we're still working on and we don't understand, but there's a fair amount of it that we do. And water has a very significant role 
in when and how uh, rocks melt. The investigation into why the Ring of Fire is so dangerous has uncovered two important pieces of evidence. Blocky lava flows are evidence of thick, viscous magma which traps gases inside volcanoes, leading to explosive eruptions. And hornblende crystals reveal that water deep underground encourages the formation of the magma that powers the volcanoes. Next, the geology detectives figure out how this water gets underground and make a remarkable discovery, the chemical signature of microscopic organisms inside the volcanoes. All around the ring of fire, explosive magma is forming deep underground, fueled by water. Solving the mystery of where this water comes from is the key to how scientists will figure out why the Ring of Fire is so dangerous. The investigation now turns to Mount Lawson, an active volcano in Northern California. Surrounding the volcano are bubbling hot springs, boiling mud, and volcanic vents called fumaroles, belching superheated steam and gas. All this thermal activity is driven by the immense heat rising from magma deep underground. By sampling the gas coming from these fumaroles, scientists hope to discover the source of the water which causes the magma to form. This device measures temperature the temperature of this fumarole is 92.5 degrees C, about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So just about at the boiling point for this elevation. And that's what we want for a good gas sample, a good boiling fumarole. So you can see what's happening at the surface here, all the steam coming out of the ground. But it's the gases that are along with this steam that we look at closely. And the composition of those gases tell us about what's happening at various depths beneath the ground where we can't see. Tests on these gases, collected from volcanoes all around the Pacific Ring of Fire, have revealed something surprising. The gases contain carbon-12, a type of carbon that comes from living organisms. The specific levels of C12 found here are the unique signature of tiny sea organisms called phytoplankton. Billions of phytoplankton live in the ocean. As they grow, they absorb carbon-12 into their cells. When they die, they fall to the bottom, forming layers of sediment. In this way, their carbon-12 is transferred to the seafloor. Intriguingly, scientists have found this same carbon-12 pouring out of volcanoes all around the Ring of Fire. Volcanoes of the Cascade Range have carbon dioxide that's very rich in carbon-12, and it's almost like you're, you're cooking oceanic sediments that are rich in phytoplankton down deep beneath these volcanoes to generate the carbon dioxide you see coming out the top. That links this carbon dioxide to organic sediments way offshore in the ocean. The organic matter that was originally phytoplankton becomes carbon dioxide that we see at the surface. Seafloor sediments are getting into volcanoes, and these sediments contain seawater. This is the water that causes the rocks to melt below the volcanoes, forming magma. But a mystery remains. The magma plumes feeding the volcanoes lie sometimes hundreds of miles from the ocean. The scientists now have to figure out how the sediments loaded with seawater are moving so far inland. To find out, the investigation heads for Alaska's Chugach Mountains. The research here begins with an analysis of the local rocks. 
Oh, this is a really neat boulder that's right here. And uh, what you can see in it is that there's this whole mixture of rock types. You can see that there's this black stuff, which would originally have been mud. There's several different colors of kind of greenish rocks, which would be kind of different flavors of uh, volcanics. So here it looks like there's limestone. And uh, I'm gonna put some acid here, and if it fizzes, it's limestone. Yep, sure enough, that's what it is. And this would have formed in the ocean. And so this is made up of the bodies of little critters. It got incorporated into this rock, and now it's up here in the Chugach Mountains. The presence of jumbled oceanic rocks 20 miles from the sea is evidence that something remarkable is happening at the bottom of the ocean. The fact that you have this mixture of rock types here is evidence for the seafloor moving. Geologists know that only an enormous process called subduction could shift these mixed ocean sediments here. Subduction occurs when the seafloor moves and slides down under the land. As it descends, the top sediment layers are scraped off by the land like a snowplow scoops up snow. They're pushed up into a huge mound of mixed up rocks. The Chugach Mountains were formed in this way. The seafloor, loaded with water, now continues down into the earth. This is how seawater gets deep underground, where it creates the magma plumes that build the Ring of Fire's explosive volcanoes. Where we're at right now, the Pacific is subducting beneath us to the northwest uh, at this northern part of the Ring of Fire. It's about 20 miles beneath our feet right here. But if we were to go off that way where the volcanoes are, it's about 60 miles beneath our feet there. And so as it goes to the northwest, it subducts and then uh, brings water and sediment into the earth. That uh, ends up uh, causing melting in the mantle. And then that melt rises as magma uh, to volcanoes. The investigation to discover how water is getting down below Ring of Fire volcanoes has turned up intriguing clues. Carbon-12 samples indicating that ocean sediments are getting deep below the Ring of Fire's volcanoes. And mixed rocks in the Chugach Mountains, 20 miles inland from the ocean, are evidence that the whole seafloor is on the move, sliding deep under the land. This process is the engine that powers the Ring of Fire's killer volcanoes. But deep underground, the Ring of Fire hides another, even more deadly secret. Earthquakes that can destroy entire cities. The Ring of Fire, a lethal line of volcanoes. 75% of all the volcanoes on the planet these fiery peaks encircling the Pacific Ocean are built by tremendous forces deep in the Earth. Eruptions here have taken many thousands of lives and destroyed billions of dollars of property. But an even bigger killer is present on the Ring of Fire. Earthquakes. 90% of the world's quakes occur in this narrow band around the Pacific, often with disastrous results. Sumatra, September 2009. A giant earthquake left more than 1,000 people dead. Mexico, September 1985. More than 9,000 people were killed by a massive magnitude 8 quake that shook Mexico City and Alaska, March 1964. North America's greatest ever recorded earthquake near Anchorage. This quake was so powerful, ground movements were observed 4,000 miles away in Florida. Such awesome power drives scientists on to discover why these deadly quakes occur all around the Ring of Fire. The investigation moves to Prince William Sound, 36 miles from the epicenter of the 1964 Alaskan disaster. We're at 
the uh, northern edge of the Ring of Fire, and we're going to be looking at uh, evidence for how geologically active this area is today. Hoysler heads for Montague Island, a place that's permanently scarred by the powerful forces which shape this entire region. On land, he finds a rugged, boulder-strewn shoreline. So you can see we're at the edge of the ocean. We're in a high energy environment. There's boulders all over the place. And we're at the top of the beach. Waves have been crashing here and basically getting rid of the little tiny rocks, leaving only boulders behind. And then right here, you can see that these boulders are kind of lined up against each other like dominoes. And so it takes big waves to uh, sort of uh, flip these over and line them up kind of like dominoes like that right here. But it's not this rocky beach that reveals how violent Ring of Fire quakes can be. The real evidence lies one quarter of a mile inland. Hoysler hunts through the thick undergrowth. Hidden by the trees is a near identical line of boulders. Uh, we've hiked in, uh, thrashed through the, the alders, uh, the Alaskan jungle up to here. Uh, we're probably 25 or 30 feet above sea level at this point. And what we have here is a beach. I mean, this is basically a perfectly preserved, high energy beach environment like we were looking at down on the shoreline. And you can see here, once again, there's these big boulders that are uh, sort of laid over in this domino-like fashion. Uh, sort of pointing uphill as a result of this big wave energy, big waves pounding on the beach, flipping the boulders over, pointing in the uphill direction. This inland raised shoreline runs for hundreds of yards, parallel with the ocean. It's a key piece of evidence, and it can only mean one thing. The land itself must have recently risen up out of the ocean, taking the entire shoreline with it. It means that there was an event that was essentially an instant in which this region was uplifted to this elevation and uh, made this here. This, all, this has to have been uh, a result of a big earthquake. Really cool. What we're looking at here is a result of the 1964 Great Alaska Earthquake. Pretty much right here where we're at is where there was the largest uplift that occurred. The massive earthquake here not only lifted the land out of the sea, it also caused a wave of destruction, devastating nearby Anchorage. It was a magnitude 9.2. It was the second largest earthquake ever recorded on Earth. It was just enormous lasted four and a half minutes of ground shaking. What happened throughout this region offers evidence of the type of quake that makes the Ring of Fire so dangerous. So we know from this kind of earthquake that occurred here in 1964 that this was a thrust type earthquake or even there was a fancy term mega thrust earthquake because it was so big that occurred right here. And this is a result of the slippage of one piece of rock over another, or one underneath the other. Megathrust quakes like this are the most powerful on Earth and are one of the great dangers of the Ring of Fire. If they occur under the ocean, they can generate killer waves called tsunamis. The Great Alaskan Earthquake of 1964 caused a tsunami over 200 feet high. Waves traveled over 1,700 miles, claiming lives as far away as California. But this disaster was nothing compared to what happened in 2004. On December 26th, tragedy struck when an enormous underwater megathrust earthquake off the Asian coast generated monster waves. The coastlines of 14 countries were swamped killing more than 200,000 people. The vast scale of this disaster was a brutal indication of the power of megathrust earthquakes. And it's given urgency to finding out why these quakes happen all around the Ring of Fire. On 
Once again, the Alaskan landscape is the perfect geological laboratory. So we're headed to a seismic station in south central Alaska near the tip of the Kenai Peninsula. Millions of years of the Ring of Fire's volcanic activity and rippling earthquakes have given Alaska an incredibly rugged landscape. It's not easy to find a flat spot to land. It's clear on my side. High on the hillside lies West's seismic station protected under the yellow cover from the elements and the local bears. So this is the vault where one of our seismic stations lives. This is one of the many seismic stations that dot the state of Alaska. Several thousand seismic stations like this exist all the way from Alaska down to California. And this whole system together monitors any kind of seismic activity, any sort of earthquakes throughout this whole area. It's part of a whole network on all of the volcanoes around here, on the mainland, and throughout this whole area. So the seismic data can be used not only to judge the severity of the earthquake, or the, the magnitude, but also when taken across a number of stations to pinpoint the location of that earthquake. In Alaska, we're looking at about 1,500 earthquakes every month. And you take all of those together and you start to see patterns. They, they map out a ribbon of earthquake activity that follows all along the coast. This ribbon of earthquake activity extends all around the Ring of Fire. But it is what scientists can see below the surface that is most revealing. If you look at it from the side, you see that actually the earthquakes that are happening close to the ocean tend to be shallow, but as you go inland, they're deeper. And they create this dipping feature that uh, starts out uh, in the ocean and then dips down beneath the continent. This giant dipping feature provides conclusive evidence for how the megathrust earthquakes are generated. The earthquake epicenters exactly follow the path taken by the seafloor as it moves down underneath the volcanoes. Earthquakes are triggered as the rocks slide past each other down into the earth. It is this subduction of the seafloor beneath the land which creates the Ring of Fire's lethal megathrust quakes and builds its explosive stratovolcanoes. So all of these observations, the volcanoes, the line of seismic activity, the big earthquakes at the interface, all of those are part of one system. They all tie together and are interrelated. The investigation into why the Ring of Fire is prone to such lethal earthquakes reveals a raised shoreline, evidence that the Ring of Fire suffers the most violent megathrust earthquakes. And seismic data shows that these killer quakes are caused by subduction, the movement of the seabed, which also builds the Ring of Fire's giant volcanoes. To discover exactly where this awesome process of subduction occurs, oceanographers search for the deepest and most inaccessible places on the entire planet. The journey to understand why the Pacific Ring of Fire is so volatile has revealed the critical role of subduction, which pushes the seabed deep down into the earth. In Alaska's Prince William Sound, investigators search for where the seafloor is vanishing below the land. There are um, ridges, outcrops, canyons, gullies, um, mountains underwater and so the ability to make a continuous map of the seafloor and get a full picture of it gives you the ability to understand how the seafloor is put together and what it has to do with the way the earth functions. Reynolds is using high-tech echo sounding technology to monitor the exact depth of the seafloor. A sound wave is sent from beneath the ship 
The time it takes to reach the seafloor and return gives an accurate reading of depth. Reynolds' research shows that all around the Alaskan coast, the seabed is relatively shallow. But farther out towards the open ocean, the readings change dramatically. So in general, around the world, when you go out from land, you cross over a relatively flat shelf, down the slope, and into the deep ocean basin, which is very flat. But around the Ring of Fire, as you go out from land, across the shelf, down the slope, instead of going directly into a flat ocean basin, you go across a very deep trench. These trenches are the deepest areas on the planet. And the one around Alaska reaches approximately 21,000 feet. These giant features are called subduction trenches. The largest are deep enough to swallow all of Mount Everest. They mark the exact spot where the seafloor disappears down into the earth. The process that jolts the land in megathrust earthquakes and forms the volcanoes that make the Ring of Fire so dangerous. The Ring of Fire is named for these volcanoes that circle the Pacific Ocean. But offshore of the volcanoes, wherever you have a chain of volcanoes, you also have one of these deep ocean trenches. The location and shape of the Ring of Fire is determined not by its famous volcanoes, but by the position of these deep subduction trenches miles out in the ocean. And by mapping the location of all the trenches in the Pacific Ocean, scientists have made a further, even more significant discovery. High-tech imaging has made it possible for scientists to visualize the Earth drained of its oceans. This reveals that these deep trenches outline the edge of a giant rock slab, or plate, that makes up the entire floor of the Pacific Ocean. This huge Pacific plate is one of 14 plates which cover the entire surface of the planet. Subduction occurs where this plate rubs against one of its neighbors, producing the line of volcanoes which extends all around the Pacific. But the investigation isn't finished. Experts journey to Tiger Mountain in Washington state to figure out how such huge plates can be shifted against each other. GPS that you use to drive around can tell you where you're at on a city block or on a street to within a meter or so. But in geology, we're interested in centimeter to millimeter accuracy so that we can track the changing of the land. It's much more subtle. High on the mountainside, Flake has set up a GPS marker point. Here we are on Tiger Mountain. This is our GPS unit. What we have is these metal rods going into solid bedrock, cemented in so that there's no motion. This GPS antenna allows us to measure point positions per day of where this spot is. A network of these GPS antennas across North America provides evidence for the monumental forces which power the Ring of Fire. This is just a single antenna. There's hundreds all across the Western United States to give us a better picture of what's going on with the ground surface. By combining all the data of these GPS, we're able to see that North America is actually moving. The entire continent is moving westwards at about three inches per year. This movement is possible because the Earth's crust rides upon a hot, soft layer of rock called the mantle. Well, the mantle is so hot, and it's such a high pressure, and the temperature is hotter as you get towards the center of the Earth. That's going to want to move out and convect, just like a boiling pot of water. And so it creates a convection current coming up to the surface, which then drags along those plates on top. These phenomenal convection currents force the Pacific Plate into its neighbors, driving the process of subduction. As the plates get dragged by the mantle convection currents, they impede upon other plates. One has to give, so one dives down underneath another, and then the trapped water from its ocean sediment 
escapes and melts the upper lying mantle, and that creates hot magma that rises to the surface and creates the volcanoes that form around the ring of fire. The investigation into the forces that drive the ring of fire has now found subduction trenches that reveal the shape of the entire Pacific plate and GPS data providing evidence for the convection currents which force this giant plate against its neighbors. It is this movement of the entire Pacific plate and the resulting subduction of the seafloor down the trenches that shapes and builds the ring of fire. But one final mystery remains. Vast sections of the seafloor are constantly being destroyed. But despite millions of years of subduction down these trenches, the planet's seafloors have never been eradicated. The geology detectives can now reveal why. All around the Ring of Fire, enormous volcanoes dot a landscape warped by violent earthquakes. Offshore, the seafloor is swallowed down giant subduction trenches. But despite millions of years of subduction, the area of seafloor remains roughly the same. Geologists could only assume one thing. Somewhere far out in the ocean, volcanic activity must be creating new seafloor rocks, replacing those destroyed here during subduction. Beginning in 1977, a series of expeditions set out to investigate where this occurred. Scientists realized that if volcanic activity was constructing new seabed, the surrounding water should be warm. The Alvin submersible was equipped with high-tech sensors to discover where this warm water existed. To begin with, the crew searched the seafloor without any luck. But then they hit the jackpot. A column of rock pumping out superheated water. This is a black smoker. Measurements of the water around these features have found temperatures in excess of 750 degrees Fahrenheit. This heat comes from magma welling up from inside the planet. It was a discovery that provided the evidence the scientists needed. These volcanic marvels mark the location of giant features called mid-ocean ridges. At these ridges on the bottom of the ocean, powerful convection currents in the mantle separate Earth's plates, allowing lava to spill out onto the seabed. New oceanic crust is constantly being formed out in the mid-ocean ridges. That crust moves away from those ridges toward the edge of the continents where we're located now. In this way, the seafloor is constantly renewed, replacing material destroyed by subduction at the edges of the ocean. These mid-ocean ridges exist at the bottom of every ocean on Earth. They provide a never-ending supply of new rock keeping alive the entire plate tectonic cycle. Well, this is a planetary scale process. This is the, the planet itself circulating and the rock and the magma from deep inside the Earth welling up to the surface, forming this crust. And then that crust dives back down into the Earth at the subduction zones, at the trenches. And it, it's mixed back into the solid Earth. So great is the power driving this system that experts see no end to the constant movement of plates around the planet. The forces involved with plate tectonics caused by the heating from the inner core of the Earth is so astronomical that there is nothing that will stop it. It seems like uh, the ring of fire will go on for some period of time. It looks as if we've been having subduction here underneath southern Alaska on the order of 200 million years and uh, it looks like it, uh, th there's no evidence that's gonna stop anytime soon. But over the coming billions of years, the ongoing movement of plates will redraw the map of the world. The Pacific plate is moving and things on it uh, ride with 
uh, the plates that are being subducted. So for example, the Hawaiian Islands are moving up here to Alaska. Uh, parts of California are moving up here to Alaska. Baja, California is moving north here to Alaska. So apparently Alaska is a popular place to be. It'll be the uh, resting place of all these things. So the map of the Pacific will slowly change, driven by the immense force of subduction. This is the real story of the Ring of Fire. Subduction creates the magma plumes which build the region's explosive volcanoes. Subduction powers the violent megathrust earthquakes that shake the region, leveling whole cities in seconds and causing killer tsunamis. This process of subduction just releases an enormous amount of energy through both uh, earthquakes, through building these mountains, through volcanoes. It's just uh, really inconceivably huge. This is what makes the Ring of Fire the most geologically active and most deadly place on the entire planet. You see the whole picture of creation and destruction of a plate in the Pacific Ocean. And the Ring of Fire is the boundary of that cycle, and it's the place where all the destruction is happening. Geology detectives have now pieced together the evidence for what makes the Ring of Fire so dangerous and discovered what powers it. Violent eruptions of explosive blocky lava build the Ring of Fire's famous volcanoes. Mixed rocks from the seafloor found miles inland are evidence for the process of subduction that builds the volcanoes. Raised shorelines are evidence for giant megathrust earthquakes caused deep underground by subduction. And GPS plots provide evidence for the immense convection currents deep in the earth which drive the entire system. These giant forces have built the Ring of Fire. The energy that drives this whole convective system is really without parallel on the Earth. There's nothing else that we can compare to as far as the amount of energy and the force that moves the continents around, compresses them against one another, drags one down beneath the other. Really just awesome forces. These forces are unstoppable. And while the shape of the Pacific will slowly change, for millions of years to come, explosive volcanoes will continue to line its shores. Dynamic proof that the Earth is never at rest.